All right, it's just after right. five o'clock. Right. Five o'clock. We have a quorum. Uh, I will call this meeting of the Transportation Policy and Planning Board to order um, Monday, December 5th, 2022. Um, if the clerk would please call the roll. <clears throat> Rodri Lankella. Here. Baltazar De Anda Santana. Here. Barbara Harrington McKinney. Carolyn McAndrews. Present. Christopher McCahill. Here. Eric Paulson. Here. Grant Foster. Here. Keith Furman. Present. Randy Udell. Here. Nikki Vander Mullen, she's excused. Um, Thomas Wilson. Thank you, Sharon. We have a quorum. Um, would our tech facilitator please proceed with our standard virtual meetings opening statement? All right, welcome to our virtual meeting. We're going to cover a few basic items before beginning. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. To members and city staff members, if you are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff, if you are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. Use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak, ask questions. Staff, click raise hand when you are asked a question. The chair will do the best to call on committee members in the order in which their hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the board, please send it to the email list in today's agenda. The chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jesse. All right, approval of minutes from our November 14th, 2022 meeting. Assuming all board members have had a chance to review those if they so chose, is there a motion to approve? Thank you, Baudry. Is there a second? Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving our minutes from the November 14th, 2022 meeting, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Chair, please, it's unanimous. If you'd like to register a no vote, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, it'll go on. It's unanimous. Thank you. Are there any registrants for public comment for items not on the agenda? No. Thank you. Um, are there any communications, disclosures, or recusals from members of the board? Seeing none. Our first agenda item for the evening is Legislature 74423, creating section 16.03, establishing a transportation demand management program and amending 33.565 of the Madison General Ordinances. Uh, I have a presentation uh, that I can share. One second, I will get that pulled up. Everyone able to see this? Yep, looks good, Philip. Okay, thank you. So I'll give a brief presentation about the about the program, and then we can answer any questions that might come up. This might look a little bit familiar to some of you, uh, but I'll go through the whole thing so that everyone's on even footing. Uh, so I think the very first place to start out is what is the Transportation Demand Management Program? And really, it's a package of policies and strategies designed to shift people away from driving uh, uh, alone to other modes of transportation. So that's biking, walking, transit, teleworking, uh, but not to eliminate uh, driving as a mode of transportation. It's just to kind of level the playing field a bit. And it's really important that we do that because people are driving more now than ever. So there's been uh, an increase in VMT or vehicular miles traveled that has outpaced population growth nationally and locally. And what that looks like during our peak periods here is that some of our most important transportation corridors are completely filled with traffic and we don't have room to expand these corridors. And even if we did, we might not wanna do it because it would make it harder to be a pedestrian, cyclist and transit user and really make our really make these uh, very large barriers in our community. But it's not just about that, it's also climate change. Uh, we know that if we keep doing what we've been doing, uh, we have some of the worst outcomes. And locally what that means is rain. 
Over the last 30 years, we've had over four inches of rain additionally annually compared to the 20th century. And it doesn't always come evenly. Sometimes we get it all at once and the entire community uh, dealt with this in 2018 with flooding. So transportation is a way that we can uh, have an impact on this. Transportation is the largest contributing sector to CO2 emissions. And that's one of the reasons why the TDM program is so important. And the way that we would change things is by changing the way that we facilitate growth. So historically, whenever we have a new development, we adjust our transportation network to facilitate the trips that that new de development would, would, would generate. And with TDM, we kind of flip it on its head. So we have a new development and we do reduce the number of trips that it generates to fit within our existing transportation network. So I wonder how we do this? It's by getting people out of their cars, getting people to walk, bike, and take transit. And this is kind of a fun graphic. Uh, so it's 200 people on 177 cars and it goes five lanes wide and stretches back as far as the eye can see about three blocks. And if you take them out of their car and put them in a bus, you see that they all fit into three buses in one lane and one block. So I think that's really illustrative of how powerful it can be to get people out of their cars. And obviously we don't expect everyone to hop on the bus, but what we're talking about is going from a mode shift where we have two thirds of people driving to by themselves to something where we're increasing uh, the, the mode share for each of the other modes a bit and uh, really decreasing that, that single occupant vehicle utilization. So questions have come out about whether TDM is actually effective. And there has been national research that has shown that TDM strategies are effective at reducing BMT by these percentages. This kind of highlights why it's so important that, that we, we, we go for this, because it does make a real tangible impact. And we're not the only community doing this. We did a brief uh, skim of, of, of other communities across the country and found that there are a number of communities that are implementing TDM programs, including La Crosse, Wisconsin. And La Crosse implemented their TDM program in 2018, and we figure if La Crosse can do it, we could probably do it too. Uh, our own UW Madison has had a TDM program for decades, so uh, it's not even new to our community. It's also within our plans, so our comprehensive plan has it. Our, our transport, our, our transportation plan has it uh, in there as a, as, a, as a key recommendation. The Mayor's Sustainability Vision incorporate or includes TDM as a, as a recommendation. And it's already throughout our ordinances already. In fact, we've had TDM on the books for 20 years at this point. The problem is that the application has been uneven. Uh, developers aren't show, sure how much TDM uh, mitigation they need to actually uh, implement to meet requirements. And Plan Commission and Council have struggled to figure out how much TDM is enough. And that creates an environment of uncertainty that we don't want Madison to be known for. Uh, and example of this is Madison Yards, which some of you may have been involved in. And that was a process that took seven meetings to figure out whether the TDM that was being proposed was enough. Uh, one of those meetings was over an hour long. So this is exactly what we want to avoid with our program. So we're proposing a program that, uh, for the most part, for most projects, you would fill out a spreadsheet and submit it to staff. And that would be how you would develop your TDM requirements and submit your mitigation. We'll get into that more in a bit. So moving on to our program, we looked at a number of programs from across the country, from the oldest programs, such as Cambridge and Arlington County, Virginia, to some of the newest, like Denver, and tried to pick the best parts of each of them and, pick, and, and develop the program that we think will be very effective and simple to, to actually participate in. The very first step is to determine whether the, the program actually applies to you or not. And that's important because not every property will have TDM requirements applicable to it, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Number two, determine the requirements if TDM is applicable to you, then create a plan and submit that plan, implement it, and then report out. And most of these steps will happen within our spreadsheet that we've put together. So it'll, it'll actually determine whether TDM is applicable to you in the spreadsheet, determine the requirements, and create that plan, submitting the, the spreadsheet that we generated. And it should be something that's fairly, fairly simple and quick to fill out. So I wonder what factors determine TDM requirements. First of all, land use. Uh, land uses have different ship generation rates and will generate different amounts of traffic. So different land uses have different requirements. The size of the development, the larger the development, the higher the number, uh, the higher the mitigation requirement is. Um, proposed parking, the higher the parking ratio, the more TDM requirements uh, the property will have. That's because we know that from studies, the more free parking that's available, the more people are inclined to drive it to someplace by themselves. And then location. We provide transit base points for locating within the transit service area. We also have a couple of measures where the effectiveness of those measures is reduced by half 
if you're outside of the service areas for those measures. So to start, you identify the mitigation measures. And we've, at, we've actually incorporated 42 different mitigation measures into the program with point values ranging from one to 10. The point values were developed by, uh, by a couple of different things. First of all, the, the, the ability of each measure to reduce BMT, documented best practices, the cost of implementing the measure, and then the context, contextual relevance for Madison. Uh, and some of the measures, like I mentioned, have modifiers, uh, particularly transit, car share, and bike share. If you're not located within those service areas, uh, we, we don't want to encourage implementing those measures to meet mitigation requirements. Next, uh, we created a, a TDM requirement modifier system. And this was at the, at the request of the, devel the development community. Um, basically, it, it's, it's, very, it's, it's easier to meet TDM requirements in dense urban environments, such as the downtown and campus area and near the BRT line. Uh, so the development community requested that we devise a system to make it easier to meet requirements in the periphery. And by easier, I mean more practical. Uh, in the periphery, it was very challenging, particularly in areas that don't have transit service to meet requirements. So this is a system where you would need to meet 100% of the generated TDM uh, mitigation requirement in the downtown, and then the periphery it would decrease all the way down to 65%. That's not to say it's easy in the periphery. That just means that it's there are more than one or two options to, to, to get there, uh, to meet the requirement. Next, we talked about the transit base points. Now, this map will be updated in the, in the final plan. Uh, as the network redesign is finalized. But basically, the, the gist is that in the, within the BRT service area, a project would receive five base points. Within the all-day transit service area, they would receive three base points. And within the peak only period uh, service area, one point. Outside of the transit service area, a project would not receive any points uh, for transit base points. And then I mentioned the TDM tool. Uh, this is the tool that we developed. And basically what this would do is generate whether or not you, uh, the TDM program is applicable to a specific project based on the characteristics of that project. So you would walk through it, enter the location of the project, the land use category, uh, the characteristics of the property. So for a residential, it'll be the number of dwelling units, for employment use, the size of the building, and then the, the amount of parking provided, and it would let you know whether there's a TDM requirement or not. If there is, the second sheet in the spreadsheet uh, would tell you the number of points that you have to meet, to meet requirements, and then you could go through and select the check boxes next to each of the mitigation measures. When enough points are provided, it will say compliant. You could save the spreadsheet and submit it to the city, and that would be uh, you, the demonstration of your compliance in the program. This would be by uh, re, need to be recertified bi biannually as well. So a couple of considerations. Uh, this program would go into effect six months after council approval. Uh, the program would not impact existing properties until there's an expansion of parking, expansion of the use, or a change of use, or a redevelopment of the site. So uh, day one, there would be no change and there, things would phase in over time. I wanted to touch on some of the modifications that we made to the program due to our, our engagement efforts with the development community. We've, we've actually made approximately 40 modifications to the program due to developer and stakeholder feedback. And in staff's opinion, uh, the, this feedback has been really valuable. In fact, it's made the program more implementable, more feasible. Uh, it'll make uh, administration of it easier and hopefully reduce the burden on all involved parties. So we really appreciate the, the partnership that we've had with the de development community. Highlight some of these changes. First of all, is the, um, the modifications, uh, uh, the modifiers that we put together, the modifier map that, that terraces uh, the requirement down the further you are from downtown. That was a direct result of communication with the development community. Uh, we reduced our reliance on walk score. Initially, the program had a significant reliance on walk score, um, which is the proprietary algorithm, number one. And number two, it could penalize catalytic development and reward all development that comes after. So we got rid of that. We streamlined a number of the measures to reduce the complexity of the program. Uh, we adjusted the point values in the program to more closely coincide with the cost uh, to implement each of the measures. Uh, we developed a procedure for uh, applying TDM to the, to the malls uh, as they redevelop and other multi-use sites. We also created a point reduction and appeals process. This is something that came out um, fairly relatively recently where uh, for existing properties as they're brought into the program, it may be infeasible for some properties to actually fully participate in the program. 
So we created a, a process where staff would have the ability to reduce the mitigation point requirement by up to five at the staff level for either physical constraints or cost considerations uh, with meeting the full requirements. And if more points were required or requested to be mitigated, um, the, the applicant could request to go to the Transportation Commission for further reduction. Uh, so that would be only for existing properties. All new properties would have to meet the full requirement. But that was a, a change based on that feedback from the development community. Uh, we also clarified a number of the measure of the definitions of measures and split some measures to make them either more achievable uh, and, and, and to provide more, um, more points for some of those. An example is for showers and uh, uh, lockers. Those are, that was one measure that provided one point. We divided that in half. So if an employer were to provide a locker, that's one point. If they were to provide a shower, that is another point. Uh, we also changed the certification process to be biannual instead of annual. And added additional outreach meetings, which we've gone to since our, we previously brought this to the, trans, uh, to the TPPB. Uh, we've also made a commitment to report out six months after the program is implemented. So that'd be around this time next year, gathering feedback from those that are actually actively participating in the, in the program. And we would take that feedback to the Transportation Commission to make adjustments and changes to the program as necessary. So now I want to go through a couple of concerns that have been um, uh, emailed out to everybody um, and kind of go through the staff response to some of those. Um, so we have a number of these and then some of their proposed solutions that we'll go through as well. First of all, uh, TDM will only have a modest impact. Madison residents work outside the, of the city and the majority of employees commute in. And for that, we would say that TDM promotes alternative transportation, all forms of it. And we acknowledge that uh, while we're trying to level the playing field, driving might be the only option for some folks. And that's totally fine. That's why we're not eliminating the option to drive places. Um, we are trying to level the playing field so people have options. And this is important because as a community, we've been making significant investments in regional transportation, bringing in Sun Prairie and Monona into our metro system and building BRT. So this is a way to enhance those investments, get more people using them and take advantage of the things that we've been focusing a lot of our resources on. Next, uh, the, there was a comment that the TDM program encourages owners to charge separately for parking and that could pre present a hardship for single parents. Uh, to that, I mentioned earlier that we have 42 mitigation measures in the program. There are only three measures that are actually parking related measures and they are the most valuable measures in the program. Don't get me wrong, but that's because they're also the hardest to implement and they're the most valuable. So that's why they're worth 10 points because if you were to eliminate parking at a site, there's a higher likelihood that people are going to take other forms of transportation to get there. Uh, that said, it's still possible to get those 10 point uh, measures by, have, by providing a transportation allowance, for instance, which could pay for parking, but it would also allow those who don't need to want the parking to use that transportation allowance to repair their bike or buy a bus pass or, or any other transportation option they might have. So there are ways to get there. It just requires a change in thinking and a change in mindset. Um, and we've made sure that it's possible to meet the TDM requirements without implementing those parking policies. So there are multiple paths to get there for properties throughout the community. So um, again, this comes down to those measures being incredibly effective at reducing VMT. So that's why they're worth so much. And then the final thing to think about is that not all employees have access to free parking. So the TDM program and some of these mitigation measures could actually present employees with new opportunities. It could be very beneficial to employees. Employees that don't have parking uh, might receive a bus pass as a result of this program or might receive a place to park their bike or a shower. So uh, I, I wouldn't look at it as being completely negative for all people, um, in, in, in particularly in the way that was presented. I think it could actually present options for people and uh, there are multiple ways to get there. Next, we heard that new multi-tenant employment or commercial buildings are unable to meet TDM requirements and the examples in the program in downtown Madison are unfeasible. And in our in, in staff's opinion, that that doesn't quite make sense. Um, new new buildings are actually easy, it's actually easier for new buildings to meet TDM requirements than existing buildings, and that's because of some of the flexibility that you have with a new building. So implementing a shower, for instance, like I've mentioned a couple of times, in a new building, it would be easy to build in a, a shower that could be shared amongst all the users, giving all of the tenants in that building access to those mitigation points. In an existing building it might be difficult to add a shower space, for instance. So 
Uh, it's one of those things where I think that it, it, uh, it might be a little bit overstated there. The other thing is in multi-tenant buildings, uh, you have the opportunity to receive points for sharing parking, for adding to the land use mix, things of that nature uh, that just kind of come inherent to having a, a mixed use building. So um, we've tested this on many projects, including our, our own projects, such as the village on Park Street. And if you're familiar with that project, it's actually a four phase project. And one of those phases, the second phase is building a parking ramp. So that's basically the most challenging thing that we could do. And we were able to meet requirements. And I'm not going to say it was easy to get there, but it's certainly possible. And uh, so we are holding ourselves to the same standard that we would hold anyone else. Next, we heard that most tenants will refuse to take responsibility for TDM and will require uh, rental reduction to implement, and that owners will not want to shift the responsibility of TDM of the TDM program onto their tenants due to the potential fines. Um, we responded to this uh, over a year ago by labeling measures as, based, uh, as either infrastructure-based or programmatic-based. So things such as adding a bike rack or um, physically modifying the site, that's infrastructure programmatic or things like providing bus passes. So we've separated these out so that if a developer wanted to pursue all infrastructure-based solutions, they would have those options available. Uh, so we, we feel like we've, we've, we've done that, which has been helpful. Um, but it's important to acknowledge that many businesses already offer commuter perks and benefits such as transit passes or commuter alternatives programs. Um, and that in and of itself is a 10 point measure. So many businesses are already doing the things that would be necessary to receive 10 points. So it would be in the owner's best interest to take advantage of those things when the, when the, the applicant is actually doing it. Uh, then the other thing is that building owners often shift responsibilities uh, of city requirements to their tenants already. Things such as uh, zoning and property maintenance concerns, those are already shifted to tenants uh, in, in some cases. Um, think about mowing lawns. If in, in some cases that will be in a lease agreement that a tenant must maintain the lawn if the owners find that fine is passed along to the tenant. So this isn't a new concept. It's something that's already happening. Uh, we also heard that it's challenging to comply with the TDM requirements in a suburban environment. And to this, we have created the modifier system, which uh, suburban properties are only, as, as currently constructed, required to meet 65% of the requirements of a property in the downtown core. We've also tested a number of properties on the east and west side of the community across a variety of uses to make sure that it's possible to meet TDM requirements using a variety of measures and re reaching the requirements in a variety of ways, including properties that were the, the development community has submitted to us. So uh, in, our, in our numerous tests, we were able to meet requirements, and in our mind, it, it it's really a mind shift set, uh, a shift in mindset that is needed to meet those requirements. And uh, we, we think it's completely feasible and possible uh, with the existing uh, set of mitigation measures. Um, again, there's that appeals process too that we, we created to address some of these concerns if it's completely impossible. And there's the ability to create your own measure as one of the measures as well, so that we feel that there are many paths to reach the requirements. Uh, next, we heard that the TDM program will apply to tenant spaces constructed before the TDM ordinance was enacted when uses change. And to that, we would say yes. Um, without this requirement, we would create a two-tier system of development within the community between existing properties and new properties. And we wanted to avoid that. And the, the program is designed in a way that it would bring existing properties into compliance over time so that that is not the case. So one of the things that has been mentioned is that um, uh, when sub-uses change, we're bringing properties into the program. And that's true. And one of the reasons for that, um, I guess an explanation is we have uses. Uses are things such as employment uses or commercial uses. Um, and underneath those categories, we have additional uses. So under commercial, for instance, you might have coffee shop, tavern, uh, retail store, doggy daycare. Um, all of those sub-uses have different chip generation rates and could put different pressures on our transportation network. So in our estimation, that's the appropriate time to bring something into the program as the sub-use changes. Let's say you have a retail store that becomes a coffee shop. At that point, we would want to bring that tenant space into the program uh, because the stresses that it would place in the transportation network are so different. Um, it's also important to, to recognize that many properties are exempt from the program, such as employment uses under 10,000 square feet. 
and commercial uses under 40,000. So it wouldn't impact those properties already. So it would impact some, but not all of them and certainly not the smallest businesses. So we heard a number of proposed changes to the program too, including adding a sunset provision, which is something that um, I think it's important to acknowledge that if the sunset provision were in there, it wouldn't roll back the TDM requirements, which are already in the ordinance. It would only roll back the TDM program. So that uh, creates that environment of uncertainty that this program was designed to eliminate. Um, it also jeopardized the funding of the staff positions associated with this position. Right now, as it's constructed, there's one full-time staffer that would staff the program, and then any additional staffers would come from the funding associated with um, application, the, the actual applications themselves. So uh, it would jeopardize our ability to use that funding for another staff position. So uh, that could je jeopardize this, the processing of applications. Next, there was a request to remove TDM uh, program applicability to existing properties. And again, we think that this would create a two-tier system of development, discourage redevelopment of existing properties, and significantly reduce the effectiveness of the TDM program over time. Uh, and the goals of reducing greenhouse gas emission would be really significantly impacted. So we are, we are certainly against that. Uh, next, there was a request to modify the unbundling parking measure. Um, so right now, as it's currently constructed, unbundling parking covers all parking on a site. The uh, proposal was to allow unbundling parking to cover only uh, garage parking in a building and allow surface lots to be completely free and uncontrolled. And in staff's judgment, that would completely um, reduce the effectiveness of the measure. Uh, it would sh simply shift people from uh, parking in a garage to parking in a surface lot, and uh, really it wouldn't be that wouldn't be as effective as, as as it could be. It could be submitted as an other unique measure with a reduced point value, but it shouldn't be worth the full 10 points. Um, and then we heard that we should double the point values for certain low value TDM measures. It's important to highlight that the measures that were brought up in that document were all some of the lowest impact measures. And we've already worked with stakeholders to modify most of those measures to make them easier to implement. An example is for a bike workstation. Uh, initially, you had to have the workstation and keep lubricant, uh, filled at the workstation and the feeling from the development community is that that would make that a programmatic measure and to be an infrastructure-based measure, you'd have to remove the lubricant. So that was a concession that we made. Um, so that makes that easier to, to actually implement. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that the modifier system already nearly doubles the impact of these measures in the periphery. So a measure such as a bike workstation, for instance, if you're building in the periphery, it's worth almost double what the intent was and doubling it again would make it worth almost eight times more. So that is that is a concern from the staff st st standpoint because it might mean that uh, nothing would change to meet and, and, and a bunch of properties would simply meet the requirements as, as is. And all of that would significantly reduce the efficacy of the program. Uh, another concern is that doubling some of the measures would actually increase the value to, to, to be in line with some of our other more expensive measures. Uh, for instance, there was a measure uh, that was brought up, um, basically a, a storage place for packages that are delivered. It's worth two points right now. Doubling that would make it four, and that would mean, mean that that measure is worth almost as much as installing a B-cycle station. So it could lead to, to changing a bunch of measure and point values, something that over time we've, we've worked to adjust with the development community. I'm not sure where exactly you draw the line. I just wanted to go through the timeline and we're nearing council consideration. That's tomorrow. Uh, so we've gone through, uh, we've introduced this. It's gone to Plan Commission, Sustainability, and the Transportation Commission. And with that, uh, that's, that's all that I have in the presentation and uh, available for any questions. All right. Thank you, Philip. Um, we do have some registrants for public comment. Let me bring that up here quick. All right, our first registrant is uh, Bill Connors, 25 West Main Street, 5th floor of Suite 33, Madison, uh, neither in support nor opposition, uh, wishing to speak, representing Smart Growth Greater Madison. Um, I do see Bill. So Bill, you've got three minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I hope you will ask me many questions because three minutes is far too short a time to address a complex new program like this. 
First, I want to thank Philip Gritzmacher and members of Smart Growth for spending countless hours developing a shared understanding of how the proposed new TDM program is supposed to work, sharing concerns, and attempting to address those concerns to make this a better, more effective program. We are thankful for the changes that have been made thus far, but there are more concerns that have not been resolved. We know that all the following things will happen sometimes as a result of the new TDM program. Single parents who cannot use transit because they must pick up their kids before and after work will have to pay to park at work. There won't be enough parking places for two people sharing an apartment to both be able to park their cars at their apartment building. Businesses in new large mixed use buildings will have to pay their employees not to park at the building. The building owner will not be the one making the parking cash out payments to the employees. Commercial spaces in neighborhoods all over the city will stay vacant longer periods of time. Commercial tenants will choose to locate where they do not have to deal with the consequences of the new program. In existing buildings in Madison that are exempt, in buildings in Middleton, Fitchburg, and Sun Prairie, or in buildings in other metropolitan areas. Apartment residents will park their cars on neighborhood streets to avoid paying a fee to park in the parking lot for their apartment building. All tenants in an apartment building will pay higher rents so that some of the tenants who want to use transit passes can get them for free. We know all these things will happen sometimes, but we do not know how often these unintended negative consequences will happen. Yesterday, I emailed changes that Smart Growth is requesting to the proposed new TDM program to make it a more effective program. Earlier today, I emailed you a revised document containing an updated version of re the requested change number six. I hope you've read these documents and uh, this document and will ask me questions about it. It is hard to imagine why anyone would object to the study part of Smart Growth's first requested change. Adding this required study and report is necessary to assure that information is obtained from the commercial tenants, employees of commercial tenants, and apartment residents who will be directly impacted by this new program. It also is hard to imagine why anyone would object to Smart Growth's third and sixth requested changes, which would modify the words of the proposed ordinance and program to match the intent. Applying the new program to parts of existing buildings when the use or subuse changes will contribute little to the positive impact of the program, but likely will have a substantial negative impact each time it occurs. Smart Growth's second requested change is to remove this provision. Smart Growth's fourth requested change would increase the number of TDM plans for new apartment buildings that include charging tenants separately for parking in underground parking structures. Smart Growth's fifth requested change would make it feasible for a developer of a future multi-tenant a employment use building to be able to attract commercial tenants while also being able to submit a TDM plan that contains enough points to comply with the new TDM program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Are there any questions for our speaker? All right, seeing none, our next speaker is, hold on, I've got my, there we go is uh, Linda Lanehertz, neither in support nor opposition, wishing to speak. Um, Linda, uh, go ahead, you have three minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Hi, I'm sorry, I registered for the, um, meant to register for the TOD overlay. Okay, I'll call on you when we get there, thank you. Thank you. All right, our next is, uh, next registrant is Ann Kovich. Uh, 2605 Golden Gate Way, Madison, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. That's um, chair of the TC. Um, are there any questions for Anne? I'm seeing none of any come up, of course, we can ask her. She's here. All right. Our next is um, Peter Taglia, 718 West Brittingham Place, Madison, Wisconsin, in support, not wishing to speak. And that's all the registrants that I have. Um, is that the um, rest of the list? Oh, anyone else, any new registrants? Sharon? No. Okay, thank you. All right, questions for Philip. Uh, Tom, I'll have you go ahead first. Yeah, I just want to, I, I emailed you and Alder um, Foster. There is a, 
a small change that needs to be done in the wording at, at three locations. And I, I just wanted to make you aware of that. And I think Alder Foster that um, it has to do with the enactment and kind of clarifies it within the ordinance. Um, so um, you can go forward with your questions and all that. I just wanted to put that as a background so that, that the, the board is aware of that. Okay, thank you. Um, questions for staff? All right, Alder Foster, you're up first. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, just wondering, uh, Phil, if you could share um, feedback and uh, recommendations from the other committees that have received this. The other committees have uh, approved this unanimously uh, through each of them. Uh, there were some minor modifications made at the Transportation Commission, um, many of them to adjust some uh, language within the, the ordinance itself to clarify things. Um, in particular, Chapter 33, there was an adjustment there to ensure that the structure of the ordinance matched the existing structure. But for the most part, it, it's been approved unanimously and well received. Uh, great, thank you. All right, and of course, we do have TC Cherkovich on the call with us. Um, any additional questions for? Staff? Um, seeing none, is there a motion? Move adoption. Thank you, Alder Furman. There's a motion. Is there a second? Um, it's like Badri. Uh, discussion, Alder Furman, would you like to speak further to your motion? Um, sure, I'll, I'll be I'll be brief. Um, I, I really just wanna say how much I appreciate all the work that's been put into this. Um, uh, anybody, uh, members that have been part of Transportation Policy Planning Board for a while know that this is something we've been talking about for a very, very long time. Um, I appreciate that the presentation went into how much time was spent on an individual project because we didn't have something like this in place. Um, a little bit ago, we saw a, um, a, a, a version of this and um, there were, it, it didn't seem complete. Um, and I think uh, in the, I don't know, time is very hard to tell these days, but I know uh, since then um, we have seen it a few more times and I really just appreciate how much work and thought has been put into this. Um, uh, the, the, the working with the community, uh, et cetera, um, I think has just been fantastic. And so um, I wish we could uh, build more lanes to our roads. Actually, I'm not sure I wish that, but we can't. Um, and uh, th this is, we desperately need this. Um, and uh, I think this is gonna help um, Madison grow in the right way. And um, I'm really grateful for, for all the work. So thank you. All right, thank you, Alder Furman, it was well, well said. Um, any further comments, questions, or discussion? All right, seeing none, on the, mo on the uh, motion to recommend adoption, Reading section 16.03, establishing a transportation. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, and I, I don't want to insert myself in your deliberations, and so I, I apologize. Um, there is a request from staff to amend those three words um, so that this could be an, an amended substitute. Um, Philip, you might have it up. Could you maybe describe that? Uh, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, it changes the word uh, effective uh, enactment date to effective date. Um, it, it's it's more of a legal uh, concern that if we uh, have the wrong terminology in there, it could make the program effective immediately, as opposed to the six month phase in, which was the intent. So it's really a, a cleanup to ensure that uh, the intent of the program is actually legally there. Thank you for that clarification. Any any objections to um, to that? Alder Furman, that's okay with your motion? I assume so, just double checking. All right, um, last call then for um, clarifications, questions, discussions, comment. All right, seeing none. On the motion to recommend adoption, reading section 16.03, establishing a transportation demand management program and amending 33.565 of the Madison General Ordinances. All those in favor, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Any abstentions? 
Chair sure, believes it's unanimous. If you'd like to register a no vote, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, that will go on as unanimous. Um, thanks to everyone. Thanks, staff. Thanks to all of our speakers. Um, all right, we'll move on to our next item. Uh, Tom, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to clarify it because I actually have to report to the council clerk tomorrow morning. So what was just passed, I believe, was the TDM ordinance and plan with the words. Um, mo That's correct. The, the modifications that you um, just described for us. You and okay. Yeah, yep. I just wanted to be crystal clear so that yep. we don't get in trouble. Yep. So, thank you. Anyone, anyone on the board not have an understanding? Okay, I, I believed it was everyone's understanding. Too. All right. Moving on to our next item, Legistar 74703, amending sections within Chapter 28 of the Madison General Ordinances to implement the new Transit Oriented Development (TOD) Overlay District. I believe uh, Ben Zellers is here to provide yep. a, an overview. Uh, presentation. Sounds good. Go ahead, Ben. Yes, uh, I will be presenting. I'll go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so yeah, here to uh, give you an overview of transit-oriented development overlay zoning. Uh, Heather Stouter, um, our planning division director, and Katie Bannon, our zoning administrator, are also available as staff uh, if there are any questions towards the end of this presentation. Um, so this is something that uh, the plan commission uh, has been working on with staff for over a year now, um, and we have drafted language available for review. Um, was part of the Legistar file on the agenda, as well as a in-depth staff memo uh, talking about TOD and uh, the various components of it and why it's necessary. So um, I'll just be giving a, a, a kind of abbreviated overview of those elements, um, and then we'll certainly be available to answer any questions that the committee has. Um, so this is the area we're talking about, the area shaded in purple, um, and you can see it's located around bus rapid transit um, lines, the approved east-west line shown in red, the planned north-south line shown in green, and then also high frequency local bus service um, per the metro redesign shown in blue. Um, and so this TOD overlay boundary um, really is in addition to the existing zoning. So the existing zoning will continue to be maintained. The regulations and requirements of the TOD overlay are added on top of that. I'm gonna get into a little bit more uh, about what that means uh, in future slides, but it's not a not really a rezoning, um, just some additional requirements, some bonuses and additional requirements to go with the existing zoning in these areas. Um, so this is about 15% of the city's land area that's shaded in purple here. And I would note that um, the boundaries are a little bit, um, you know, jagged, a little go uh, fluctuate in and out a little bit um, because this boundary does not include historic districts, doesn't include the UW or the downtown. Um, UW is ruled out because they're subject to a campus master plan that's adopted by the city. So that's kind of what governs development and, you know, 98% of that, that area um, downtown ruled out um, it's already very transit oriented and also is subject to uh, existing height bonus or height uh, caps under, under zoning. Um, as far as what I'll be covering, what the ordinance itself covers in this presentation, um, we'll be talking about residential dwelling unit bonuses under TOD overlay, building height bonuses, site standards for buildings, site standards for automobile infrastructure, and then parking and loading standards as well. Um, so as far as residential dwelling unit bonuses, the approach that the plan commission um, and staff have taken in the uh, proposal that is in front of you tonight is that for districts that allow residential development as a permitted use, the next increment up in residential intensity would be allowed as a permitted use under the TOD overlay zoning. Um, so just as an example of that, duplexes would be allowed as a permitted use in single family districts. Um, for a multifamily district like SRV2 um, that currently allows up to 24 dwelling units uh, as a permitted use, that would get bumped up under TOD to up to 36 units as a permitted use. And then uh, for a mixed use uh, zoning district example, TSS zoning currently has a maximum of 48 units as a permitted use that would be bumped up under TOD overlay to 60 
uh, dwelling units as a, as a permitted use in a, in a mixed use building. Um, then also TOD overlay uh, allows up to 24 dwelling units in a mixed use building as a permitted use in TE zoning. Right now, TE zoning, all residential units are um, uh, conditional use. Um, and TE zoning is very common in uh, like the Cap East corridor. That's kind of uh, really one of the prime areas where TE zoning is currently mapped. Uh, this TOD overlay also has building height bonuses in select uh, zoning districts, select multifamily, mixed use, um, and uh, commercial zoning districts. Um, so, for example, the SRV2, TRV2 uh, multifamily districts, and then the NMX and TSS mixed use districts would go from a maximum three story height as a permitted use to four story maximum height as a permitted use in TOD. Uh, the TRU2 multifamily residential district would go from four to five story maximum height as a permitted use. Uh, the CC uh, commercial district would go from a maximum height as a permitted use from five to six stories. And then the RMX district would go from five to eight as a permitted use. Um, and really the only where, place that is currently mapped is uh, for a few proactive rezoning parcels in the Oscar Meyer area, but we are looking to continue uh, using that fairly new zoning district uh, in the future. Um, and while this, these bonuses don't uh, have 100% compliance with uh, existing adopted plans, uh, it does really bring zoning closer into compliance overall with the plans that have been adopted over the past 15 or so years. Um, this is something that we as staff have, have looked at um, and, and reviewed for those, those plans that have been adopted over the past 15 years. Uh, site standards for buildings is a section within this TOD overlay ordinance, um, and this includes requiring maximum setbacks for principal buildings. It also has a requirement for uh, building entrance orientation to have entrances that face um, pu public streets. Um, and then there's also a minimum height of two stories within the TOD overlay area for uh, select zoning districts that really, really just applies to multifamily, mixed use, commercial, and employment districts. Um, and there are very limited exceptions to that. Um, things like greenhouses or community centers um, are among the handful of exceptions to that minimum two-story height uh, within TOD overlay. And the ordinance also has site standards for automobile infrastructure. Um, so auto-oriented uses are still allowed within TOD overlay, but they are subject to some additional design-based regulations to limit uh, the impacts. And those include parking, loading, dry vials, gas pumps, and other auto-oriented infrastructure cannot be located between the building and the street. Drive-throughs must be located under the building and covered by upper floors. Um, this is actually a regulation that's already in place specifically for the TSS zoning district, the traditional shopping street district, and that would really just be then implemented for other drive-throughs that might be constructed in the future within the TOD overlay. And then parking structures must be aligned with active ground floor uses along a certain percentage of the ground floor of a parking structure. Um, and standalone parking structures are fairly you know, uncommon, uh, usually, uh, they're part of or integrated into adjacent um, or basically same parcel development. Um, but this would be you know, something along the lines of what was done for the city's newest uh, parking garage in the Cap East area um, in terms of having a liner uh, use along that parking structure. Um, and then the final component is parking loading standards. And this is actually not part of this TOD section within the code. We integrated this into the parking section of the, the zoning code, just uh, feeling that that would be a little bit easier to, to manage and understand. Um, but this does include decreased automobile parking maximums for parcels within the TOD area. And then there's no minimum automobile parking standards uh, within the TOD area as well. And then the adequacy of the amount of automobile parking would not be a standard any longer for conditional uses when no minimum parking is required. And so that obviously impacts the TOD overlay, but also would uh, 
be a change that impacts some other uh, districts as well, uh, whether or not they're in uh, the TOD overlay area. Uh, so just wanted to recap also why this is something that uh, we're pursuing as, as a city, um, as a plan commission, as staff, um, and as policymakers as well um, with the, the sponsors of this ordinance. Um, one of the big things is that it would implement various city plan recommendations, and there's a larger list of these within the uh, more in-depth memo uh, that's part of this uh, legislative item. But uh, really, the, the main on-point item is the comprehensive plan, which is uh, Strategy 5 Action A that says that uh, the city should implement TOD overlay zoning about long bus rapid transit and other existing and planned high-frequency transit service corridors to create development intensity. I just realized that my camera had been obstructed for part of this presentation. So getting that up, I don't. Um, uh, to create development intensity minimums, reduce parking requirements and support transit use. Um, we should also have a zoning code that really supports development that is called for in adopted plans. Um, and as I mentioned, this is really goes beyond the comprehensive plan. Um, to another a number of other policy documents that the city has adopted really just over the past few years. And then really also to better match zoning with city investments in transit. Um, you know, obviously, the city is investing a lot in, in this metro net network redesign, um, investing even more in the bus rapid transit uh, east-west system that's been approved, and then uh, also pursuing north-south bus rapid transit as well. Um, and then increase mobility of residents without needing to get into a car. Um, really also kind of speaks to some, some other, uh, or ties in with some other components of this. Um, reduces household expenses, um, so allows households to have that mobility without, um, you know, the expensive aspect of vehicle ownership. Can allow households to go car light, kind of reduce the car ownership that they, they need or potentially go car free. Also provides for a more efficient use, use of land, um, has um, means possibly less development on the edge of the city if we're able to accommodate more residents within this TOD area. That would in turn mean that we have less need to extend utilities and infrastructure, um, which means less to maintain for the city over the long term. And then also means less land for parking and, and more land for people. Uh, High-end component of that is slowing the increase of traffic within the city, even as we grow in population fairly significantly over the next 20 plus years. And then um, this also kind of ties into something that Philip mentioned is uh, reduce emissions and driving's negative impact on the environment. Uh, TOD overlay zoning ap approval process. So this was introduced at Common Council um, on November 22nd. We're in front of you here tonight. Um, December 12th, we'll be going in front of the Plan Commission. That'll be a public hearing uh, with the Plan Commission. And then uh, timeline calls for Common Council consideration on January 3rd. Um, so with that, uh, turn it back over to the committee for any public testimony and then any questions and comments from committee members. Thank you, Ben. Um, I believe we have two registrants for public comment I wish to speak. Um, the first is going to be uh, Helen Kitchell, um, 225 Potter Street, Madison, Wisconsin, in opposition, wishing to speak. Um, I see Helen there. Helen, as soon as we can get you on, you've got three minutes and you may begin when you're ready. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so my biggest concern is that, well, first of all, let me start off by saying that it only makes sense to go ahead and promote development along transportation corridors. That's something that the city has been doing unofficially, I think, for quite a while. Um, but what concerns me is that is the ordinance um, and the the maybe unforeseen ramifications of, of implementing that ordinance and requirement on future development. Um, in part because it's there are parts that a lot of attention was given to the comprehensive plan for the city and looking at potential uh, development along corridors. And one of the biggest concerns I have is with regard to an increase in gentrification because of this pro 
this development that is being promoted. As that as the development occurs, it will incre- it will increase um, property taxes for those people that live in those corridors um, and in many of those corridors, and I am primarily concerned with the South Park Street corridor, um, there is existing affordable housing. And more importantly, there is existing retail, um, uh, I guess, stores and and restaurants and the likes. And what we have along South Park is a lot of what I call mom and pop ethnic places. And what happens is as this ordinance is implemented, these are little one-story buildings. They will be mandated to become two stories if they want to improve their building at all. And they won't be able to afford to build another whole second story. It'll basically be pushing them out um, along with the gentrification that comes from building these bigger and better buildings. And then the allowable, the housing that is existing there that's already affordable um, will get um, pushed out of the market. And admittedly, there is still gen- there's existing gentrification that occurs, but um, this will promote it in a faster pace. Um, so what I'd like to ask is that there be somehow a consideration for those cultural resources that are part of these um, these areas of the city and not lose those inside of it. I don't know how what the wording would be to implement how that can be preserved and how that can be noted as exceptions for the norm. But I hate to see us lose and just become uh, these quarters of high rise buildings. So I'm I guess I'm just trying to ask for um, an eye to how to keep those kind of cultural and ethnic areas of the city intact and not just become bulldozed over high rise buildings. Um, And that's that was my uh, primary concern that our need is for affordable rental property. These are a lot of these are going to be rental property um, for um, working class people. And what I see getting built is um, rental property for high end people. So I I don't know how, again, how the city could try and ensure that that happens more. But we what we desperately need is for working class people and not all these high end um, apartment buildings. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen. Are there any questions for the speaker? All right, seeing none, I believe we have uh, Linda Lanehertz. Lanehertz? Looks like you're still with us. You got three minutes. Yeah, I'm here. Three. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I had written a letter. I'm just going to briefly comment on it. Um, but I would like to also say ditto to the prior speaker. Um, one of my main concerns with this is this what seems to be a somewhat of a push to be including historic districts, um, whether they're local historic districts or national register districts, you've been told that everybody's protected. National register districts have absolutely no protection um, regarding redevelopment. And the reason that Madison got the categorical exclusion for the BRT is because the city told the feds that the historic districts would be excluded. The environmental documents prepared by the city also recognized that POD was an indirect effect of the project and that the FTA might need to readjust its review should historical districts be included. So I urge you to take, make an affirmative action to tell the plan commission that um, Historical districts could not should not be included because at a minimum it, it would delay the project because of the eighty million of federal funding. Um, another reason to not include historical districts: the comprehensive plan is a wide ranging document balancing a whole bunch of needs. It's not just additional housing. It's not just BRT. Comprehensive plan also recognizes that historic preservation is a goal. It said the zoning code should be made consistent with the historic preservation plan and the historic ordinance, not the other way around. And my last quick comment is I really see this TOD as an unbalanced area. Mineral Point has extremely little that at this point is going to be able to be developed by right 
under the TOD overlay. On the other hand, you look at East Washington and the whole corridor from Milwaukee Street to the end is can pretty much be redeveloped as I write under the TOD overlay ordinance. And so the east side is going to be getting a lot of TOD and the west side is going to be getting very little. So thank you. Thank you, Linda. Are there any questions for the speaker? All right, seeing none, uh, questions for staff, for Ben? Chris, uh, go ahead, please. Um, thanks. Um, I guess just since it came up in the, the, the um, speaker's questions about um, gentrification, which I think is a valid concern, um, have have any of staff thought about like, are there any real concerns that 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 the TOD overlay would cause any um, extra development that would um, hasten gentrification, and or is there anything um, that you've thought about doing to mitigate that? <clears throat> Go ahead, Heather. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for asking that question. So absolutely, that's something that the city is, is concerned about. And, and I would say that the main concern really has to do with displacement of residents and, and businesses and, and not so much with the gentrification side of things. Um, so throughout uh, the uh, engagement around transit-oriented development, one thing we've tried to stress as a staff team is that outside of the zoning realm, the city is doing a lot to try to tackle that issue. We're investing directly in affordable housing, millions of dollars in the city's affordable housing fund, utilizing TIF to support affordable housing, and also taking a much more proactive role in land banking and future development. And I think that you know beyond housing, which the city is supporting hundreds and hundreds of new units right along the transit oriented development corridor, um, I think some of the speaker's points about commercial properties are really salient. And I think, you know, the city can keep in mind uh, commercial businesses and uh, cultural resources as well as we become, um, you know, more in the driver's seat um, uh, with regard to land banking and initiating the type of development in these areas. Um, there are already some examples of that. The Black Business Hub along South Park Street is one. Um, and, and we foresee many more um, along South Park Street, East Washington, and, and more. So those are great points. And I, I think the main point from the staff perspective is that absolutely, yes, the city can play a role in uh, slowing and mitigating gentrification and displacement, but it's outside of the zoning realm. Thanks, Heather. Um, I have an unrelated question, but if Alder Furman wanted to follow up on that. Um... Maybe happy let him trip. Okay, um, so um, I like how we've moved. Uh, you know, early on, um, we were talking about prohibiting auto-oriented development, and I think that uh, we we saw there's a bunch of challenges with that. So I like that we've moved towards um, uh, regulating the design of auto-oriented infrastructure. Regarding the um, underbuilding drive-throughs, are there examples of that in the city? I'm sure there are, but none are coming to mind for me. Uh, yeah, one of the um, fairly recent ones is along Monroe Street. Um, there's an associated bank and a redevelopment close to the, the plaza area um, right across from Camp Randall that has one. And then there was a um, UW Credit Union at Cottage Grove Road um, and Monona Drive or um, you know, right close to that intersection that was very recently approved um, that has a drive-through component as well. Um, I don't know, Heather might be familiar with some additional ones, but it has happened. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll see some more examples uh, come forward with this uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, thanks. And then um, I'm guessing that there are other um, policies and mechanisms like um, Basically, there are other things regulating curb cuts uh, that aren't in this zoning overlay so that we wouldn't have like excessive like drive throughs, you know, like along a, a strip that's that's meant to be mostly pedestrian oriented. Um, maybe not explicitly, but is that pretty fair to say? 
Um, that's something I know that our uh, TE transportation engineering staff looks at as part of the project review process, um, but uh, I'm not 100% familiar with what their criteria are. I don't know if Heather or Katie has any more info on that. Maybe Tom as well. Uh, yes, uh, we do have something in our zoning code regarding distance from uh, intersections for drive through drives, um, but TE does a lot more than that in addition. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, that's great. Um, I think that's all I've got for now. All right, thank you. Um, Alder Furman, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I don't know if this is a question for Tom or planning, um, but I am curious about the um, speaker that said uh, if we um, include the historic districts in TOD, which they're currently excluded, um, would that jeopardize BRT funding or the BRT project in any way? Go ahead, Tom. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I talked with the FTA today. Um, our project has passed um, the judicial review uh, date, so a legal challenge cannot be made to the environmental document. Uh, FTA can revise um, <clears throat> their determination of the environmental document. However, they were aware of the TOD ordinance. Um, staff recommended that historic districts be excluded. They view any legislative change be um, an administ uh, a change that is outside the control of the sponsoring agency. So they view it as a separate action. And um, the person I talked to said it would not prompt a re-review of the environmental document. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that clarification. Um, I have some questions um, uh, for planning staff about historic districts. Um, I wanna start um, with, uh, trying to get a little bit better understanding, um, at least on the record of the National Register Historic Districts. I do think one of our speakers did indicate that we currently have no um, specific restrictions in the city of Madison related to National Register Historic Districts. And I just wanted to confirm confirm that, that there's nothing in our code specifically uh, when it pertains to National uh, Register Historic Districts. Go ahead, Heather. Thank you. No, that's correct. Um, the, in the National Register Districts, I'm going to use the carrot and stick analogy just for a moment. In the National Register Districts, uh, property owners do have opportunities to seek tax credits when they're restoring buildings or even making additions and changes to buildings that are, are consistent with uh, the National Register District. And so it's really a, a, a district where there's a carrot, but there's no local regulatory framework for the National Register Districts. And that's the that's sort of the opposite of our local historic districts where the city has a regulatory framework, the Landmarks Commission is involved in any substantial changes within our local historic districts. Now, as a, as a complicating matter, some of our local districts do overlap with our National Register, Register Historic Districts. But if a property is in a National Register Historic District alone, there aren't any local requirements or regulations uh, related to development in that area. It's more of an opportunity to get tax credits for uh, for work on the buildings. So this sort of sets a new precedent of saying something that's related to that we're sort of leaving something out because it's nationally recognized opposed to locally, right? I mean, obviously local, I'll get into in a moment, but um, we, you know, if there's nothing in our code, this is sort of just kind of a new restriction that we've never had in the past, which is let's not look at changing density in an area that get tech that gets tax credits. Is that is that a correct interpretation? Sure, you're you're saying a decision to exclude them from uh, the uh, would sure yes yes yep thank you yeah the exclude and include thing gets very confusing um, when I think about this so I I don't apologize in advance if I if I mess that up again. Um, I spent um, an insane amount of time um, helping uh, clarify and rewrite our local historic district uh, ordinance and um, really do uh, appreciate historic preservation preservation in Madison. Um, but I, I am curious if, if we included local historic districts in the TOD, right now they're excluded, um, does that throw out all of that ordinance work that I uh, participated in? No, no, it would. 
let me figure out how to put this. No, it would not throw that out. In fact, the Landmarks Commission would still be reviewing any and all significant changes within the local historic districts, just as they would today. I think in some cases it could exacerbate differences between what's allowable in zoning and what the Landmarks Commission might uh, review and approve. And, and so perhaps it would introduce some conflicts within our own codes, but uh, rest assured the Landmarks Commission would still be reviewing any and all changes within local historic districts of significance, and, and they would need to find their standards met uh, before a project could move forward. And, and uh, okay, so, and then also, I guess, if I'm understanding correctly, the biggest change would probably be just in the, in the area of density and, and possibly unit usage if we included historic districts. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the National Register District area is, is zoned for single family homes. And again, the main change in that area is the introduction of the possibility to add a second dwelling unit to a home or to, you know, to create a, a two flat or a duplex unit. Um, so that's the only change there. And that's a, that's a really significant chunk of the geography we're actually talking about. In other areas, um, closer to the isthmus, I think one of the main um, impactful changes would be building heights. You know, in, in some areas we're going from a, a height of three stories to four stories as a permitted use. Um, and I, I think we would, we would, probably recognize that as a change that the Landmarks Commission, still reviewing those same proposals, um, you know, may or may not um, be able to reach uh, a conclusion to support uh, a four-story building. Great. Thank you. Go ahead, Kitty. I was just going to say, you know, the zoning and, and landmarks, it's not necessarily a conflict. If they're different, the stricter is always going to apply. So just because the zoning may allow more, if landmarks allows less, then less would be allowed. Just to put it down. Thank you. Uh, Alder Foster, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Just some follow-up questions on the uh, historic district. So the, when the national one seems pretty straightforward to me, I don't really understand why uh, we would consider continuing to exempt um, exempt that. On the local side, um, just I guess, Heather, kind of clarifying what you were saying, or I guess maybe both of you. So the biggest anticipated difference, if, if we did not exempt local historic districts, perhaps um, more projects or different, pro or perhaps Landmarks Commission would see requests for a taller building than they would see now because it's theoretically would be permitted in the TOD, um, yet they would still use their standards, their et cetera, and either approve her or not. Is that is that the gist of it? That, that is the gist of what I said. And, and I think there, there are also local historic district areas within the within the same geography that that are single family homes. And so Landmarks Commission would even still see, you know, any addition to a single family home to create a second unit that involves exterior changes would also go to Landmarks Commission. And I, what I what what I mean to say is that there is a possibility that that there could be more conflicts between decisions that the Landmarks Commission could make, which are absolute, and decisions that the the plan commission and and council or even staff uh, could make when it comes to permitted uses. And so um, Katie's exactly right that, you know, the, the more restrictive applies, um, I don't think it's inherently problematic, but it is um, perhaps introducing some mixed signals and, and confusion when you see that something's a permitted use at four stories um, and then realize that the Landmarks Commission may not be able to, um, to reach uh, their support for that project. But and theoretically, the same thing could happen today. They might be permitted Absolutely. up to three stories, but yep. they still aren't. Yeah. Um, and then so on that, like single family detached to, let's say, adding a second unit. So in a non-historic district with TOD could do that by right. It would be sort of staff review um, for, for that. For um, if we if we uh, did not exempt local historic uh, and they were and the TOD was um, in effect there, that would then open up the possibility to do the same thing in a local historic, but it would still require landmarks review. 
and assumedly, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but there's things around, you know, like the facade is very important, for example. So I expect they wouldn't be able to just do whatever kind of two flat they wanted, but they would assumedly have to meet all the criteria and get still get approval from landmarks uh, to, to essentially convert from a, a one unit to a two unit. Is that that, right. That's correct. So long as that involves exterior changes to the building, you know, if you're if you're adding a if you're adding a tiny unit, unit within an existing home, it may not trigger landmarks review if there are no exterior changes. But if it's a building addition, then yes. Okay, that makes sense. And I guess just uh, is there anything? I, again, I'm just not as familiar with the landmarks um, or the historic district side of things. But um, I, I mean, it seems like the focus is primarily around the the building and less about the use so would, i mean would they concern themselves of oh it's a one unit versus a two unit if the building you know ostensibly no. was the same on the outside no you're right their their concerns are, are really with the building or the historic resources okay uh i think that covers my questions thank you all right thank you any additional questions for staff or speakers Chris, go ahead, please. Um, I guess the obvious one in my mind is with all the talk about historic districts, um, which aren't included anyway, is there a reason we should not be considering at this point including them? I don't know who that's a question for, I guess. Um, there seemed to be a lot of interest in it. <laughs> and I would also be interested in including them if there aren't any real concerns. <clears throat> go ahead, Heather. Sure. Thanks, Chris. It's a tough question. I, this is something that we did discuss, um, particularly with regard to the National Register Districts, with the Plan Commission several times over the course of the past year, and really didn't get a strong sense of consensus in either direction on inclusion of National Register Districts. Um, we as staff did provide the Plan Commission with some analysis, uh, really looking over the geography and the base zoning within the National Register District portions. Um, and so we've we've I think vetted that with the plan commission. Um, we have not, uh, you know, responding to kind of the the plan commission direction. We have not provided analysis to the plan commission or others on inclusion of the local historic districts, and so that would be new, um, and just is important, I think, for as policymakers to consider. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alder Paulson. You're up next. Go ahead, please. I guess actually I'll take a shot at answering that previous question, though Heather did uh, most of it. So as the plan commission member here, I, I think that plan commission has still been kind of having and haw on, on it and kind of chewing it over. And especially because we weren't very close to implementing, I think we've still just been kind of thinking, well, what should we do on the historic districts? And 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 the sort of, I think kind of where we were coming down was was include the national, exclude the local. But it would not surprise me at all if we um uh, uh take up the local uh as as well when we take this up uh next week so i certainly think the a recommendation from uh from tpvb would be appreciated um uh but i don't think the plan commission has has kind of thought of, thought entirely through what it's thinking so um i actually have a completely separate question and this is i think for for heather um uh uh, we have left gas stations at, at two stories uh, in this uh, in this proposal, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, what do EV charging stations wind up looking like in in uh, the zoning code? And um, what would we do to um, to a lot that's that's kind of dedicated to, to EV? Would we have to do anything special for that? Is that affected uh, in this? I kind of got there from gas stations and then it just was like, oh, wait, what if I don't need gas, but I still need to use my car for something? Um, sure. I, you know, so. I'm going to try this and I'm looking at Katie who can maybe chime in, but I think of the EV charging. Um, I know it's vastly different than a, than a gas, than a fuel pump. So don't get me wrong, but I think of it more as the, the uh, analogous to the, the pumps at a gas station 
And really what we're talking about with the two-story minimum building is uh, the convenience store portion that you think of in a typical gas station. The, the area where the pumps would be, or in the case of EV, the area where those charging stations would be, um, doesn't necessarily require a building. And, and so I, I, you know, I think that it would not be relevant to apply to EV charging infrastructure because it really isn't a building in and of itself. Katie may want to weigh in there um, with, with more thought from the zoning perspective on that. I, I agree completely. Yeah, if there's a, a convenience store with electric charging stations, then the two store would kick in, but not with the pumps. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we didn't suddenly require that you were going to, if you're going to put an EV station, that, oh, by the way, you've also got to build a two story building, um, which I would not be a fan of. All right, thank you. Um, Alder Tischler, you're up next. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, Tom could repeat the conversation he had today. Uh, what what deadline we 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 pass for review? I guess I wasn't completely clear on that. Uh, um, so we had a, a national environmental policy at, um, document. It was a documented categorical exclusion. Um, these documents. <clears throat> Uh, can be challenged in court um, for up to six months after the document is issued. Okay. Um, and that the statute of uh, limitations, uh, I think, uh, was completed in November, November 18th, I believe. Um, that being said, you know, the FTA um, um, is the uh, you know the the sponsoring agency, and so they they could um, revise um, their uh, environmental document or that action. I um, I spoke with them. They felt like um, the indirect effects of transit oriented design were incorporated in the document, so they were considered with the federal action. Um, the sponsoring uh, the the lead agency for the city, you know, Metro Transit and Transportation, um, um, as well as city planning, recommended that the historic uh, districts be excluded in the development of the TOD overlay, and then they viewed um, any actions by policymakers or elected officials as a separate action uh, outside of the control of the. The agency that's implementing VRT, and so they did not view it would change uh, their document. So the um, so that was kind of a long answer. I guess the the quick answer is that this the the term to challenge this and through the di judicial means has expired. Um, FTA can still revise their decisions, but. Um, my conversations with them today indicated that they were not inclined to change their environmental document because we we did consider um, the indirect effects of transit oriented development within the document and that um, what what legislators choose to do is outside of the control of the, the lead agency. Right. If I could do a follow up. Uh... You know, we we introduced this to the public to have it excluded. And now here we are, you know, a month away from Common Council voting, and we're having a discussion about you know, you know, putting the uh, putting the historic districts, you know, back into the overlay. Is that I mean? Is this a, is this a wise decision in your in your part to get to get public support on this? Um. You know, I, I don't want to comment on what policymakers or elected officials choose to do. I think we, throughout the process, we were very clear to the FTA saying that uh, we can make recommendations, but we cannot control the actions of our elected officials, and they may choose to do this or that or the other thing. And so uh, FTA has been fully aware of that, you know, throughout this year-long process, you might say. One more question, if I may, to uh, to Heather Southern. 
if you could explain uh, like why why we excluded the uh, historic districts in the first part. Sure, thanks, Alder Tischler. So as I mentioned, we've been um, in conversations with the plan commission about this for over a year now about the transit-oriented development overlay district ordinance. And um, early on, there was a, a thought by some commissioners that um, we wanted to reduce the conflicts that we might be creating with this new zoning ordinance um, as it related to historic resources in the city. And so that was kind of the prevalent thought at the beginning. Um, as the ordinance went through and we, we developed some of the, um, I, I guess, some, some of the, uh, the changes in the base zoning districts that would apply, we maintained uh, communication with the plan commission about uh, how the transit oriented development ordinance would impact various properties in various base zoning districts, both inside of and um, outside of the, the National Reg Register Historic Districts. Um, they continued as a commission to kind of go back and forth on it. There were some individuals that that seemed to to um, seem to think that it would be good to include the National Register districts and others on the plan commission that thought it would be good to to keep them out of it. But yeah, I think the original intent of excluding them was to minimize that uh, what was viewed as unnecessary conflict between our zoning ordinances and. Uh, our historic resources. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? All right, seeing none. Um, Alder Furman, go ahead, please. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, this, and I'd like to remove the exclusion for the National Historic Registry and local historic districts. And I'm happy to speak to that if I get a second. All right, there's a motion. Is there a second? All right, Chris seconded. Go ahead, Elder Furman. Thank you. Um, appreciate the presentation tonight. I appreciate all the work that staff has done on this. Um, I, I these these are modest changes. Um, we're not doing radical stuff. Um, we all sat through um, pretty intense uh, network redesign meetings, um, pretty uh, lots of stuff about BRT. Um, in a perfect world, we would have bus service uh, at everybody's door, but we don't, we don't have that kind of money. Um, we need to be smart uh, about zoning um, uh, where we have transit. Um, it just it, it makes a ton of sense um, uh, to, to be making sure that our transit is accessible to as many people as possible. I want to first start with the, the National uh, Register of Stuff. Um, we don't currently have restrictions related to that, as we've heard tonight in our in our ordinances. Um, I don't think we should start doing that now. Um, most of the areas, as we heard, that we're talking about with the National Historic Registry stuff, um, we're talking about it being single family or or two family or duplexes. We're not we're not talking about radical changes. Um, in the areas where we are talking about more height. It's still not radical changes. It's absolutely necessary. We're in a housing crisis. Um, we need to continue to update and take advantage of uh, zoning changes to have more housing. And then obviously we know, because we sit on this board, we're in a transportation crisis. Um, we, we don't have enough bus service. We don't have enough roads. And so we need to be putting all these pieces together um, to make this a more livable city. Um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I spent just an absolute ton of time um, revising our historic ordinance. I, I really appreciate um, historic preservation, um, but historic preservation um, is 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 about character. It's not not just dense. It's not density. And so I don't think we should say just because you're in a historic area, no density. Um, I do think we need to keep the character of those neighborhoods, and there are lots of things in the code that that go into that. Um, this won't overrule that. Um, if we allow for for this this these TOD changes in those areas, and so I just think you know yes there will be some conflicts um, with the local there will be no conflicts when it comes to the national because there's no code related to that, but I'm okay with landmarks trying to figure that out and I'm okay with with the common council trying to figure that out if people appeal decisions of landmarks. Um, we need more density in Madison everywhere desperately, but we especially need more density in transit areas. Uh, 
Uh, so, you know, I, I strongly believe that this is the the, the correct path forward. Um, I think, you know, Alder Tischler referred to, you know, surprising people. There's a full month um, for us, for Alders uh, that, that this is affecting to go out and talk to their residents. Um, there'll be a discussion at the plan commission about this. I'm sure they'll they'll weigh in and, and, and then ultimately the council will weigh in. But it's not uncommon um, for policymakers like this, this committee and like the council to be making decisions like this on introduced legislation. And I think that's important. I think we need to you know, have these discussions, talk about it. But I think ultimately um, this TOD stuff is great. I'm sorry that, that the historic stuff is probably a distraction from how great it is, um, but I do think it's an important discussion to have. Um, and uh, you know, I made my motion because I think it's important for us not to be excluding those areas. Thank you. Thank you, Alder Furman. Alder Foster, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, I would echo a lot of what uh, President Furman said there. Um, I think the, the reality is, you know, in the conver in a lot of the conversations I heard at Plan Commission, I think a lot of the consideration around the historic districts, uh, specifically the National Historic District, was really, you know, could this and somehow make things more complicated or throw things off with BRT? I think we've heard pretty clearly today that there's really no risk of that or very little risk of that happening. So that was that was honestly what I heard as the primary reason to even consider exempting the national districts um, as a starting point. So that one again seems like a, a, a real slam dunk. And um, you know what I what I've heard from staff and my understanding is that the local districts will continue to have a quite high bar protection around the form um, in those districts, and that while this might allow some things that were, are not allowed there today. They're still going to get that very specific review by um, Landmarks Commission, um, and I expect that um, that the newly updated guide will will serve us well there. Um, I just want to highlight one other thing, which is really was around the network redesign process. I remember so clearly hearing from our consultant that um, you know this this the 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 implementation of transit is all about trade offs, right? And we saw that firsthand. We saw the the pulls and pushes. You can't have it everywhere, and they told us specifically we can't we can't fix your bad land use decisions. If you put housing out in the middle of nowhere, we're not you're not going to be able to reach it efficiently with transit. And to to me, as we went through that exercise, it is just really painfully obvious that if we want people to have access to high quality rapid transit, we're going to have limited places where that's going to happen. We can look right now at our 15 minute service that we just adopted this is the best we can do as a city and it's great i'm excited for it and it does not serve a lot of the city and so we absolutely want to have as many people having access to that transit service as possible and we do not want to uh, waste the land that we have that we're providing that high level of service for land uses that aren't serving a lot of people whether that's serving them for their homes or for for their um, work trips or other trips so it's it's just really i think um and coming on us as the transportation policy and planning board to really push and and ask the city to take full advantage of the parts of the city that we are able to serve with high quality transit so i'm very supportive of the motion all right thank you are there any other comments discussion all right seeing none on the motion to Recommend adoption, recommend amending sections within chapter 28 of the Madison General Ordinances to implement the new transit oriented development TOD overlay district uh, with removing the exclusions for local and national historic districts. Please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Any abstentions? Chair, please, it's unanimous. If you'd like to register a notebook, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, that will go down as unanimous. Thank you. Our thank you to staff and to all um, registrants who provided feedback. All right, our last item then for the evening is Legistar 74924, uh, Joint Campus Area Committee discussion. Yeah, perhaps I'll uh, provide a little background. Um, <clears throat> the Joint uh, Campus Area Committee discussion is a, a committee of about 19 members. Um, some from the city of Madison, some from uh, um, Shorewood Hills, and some from UW. Um, it includes one member of a transportation-related uh, city committee. Um, the, the meetings are roughly about 
once a month. And I think they they roughly last maybe an hour and a half. In the past, uh, Baudry has served as a transportation representative on these committees. And through email exchanges, Baudry has said he'd be willing to do it again. But I think he uh, also wanted to make sure that um, there wasn't someone else that might want that responsibility or that opportunity. Um, and so that this discussion is meant to kind of open it up to see if there's other other people on, on the board that might want this. Is that a, a good summary, Baudry? Yeah, okay. All right, um, so, so Baudry, just to clarify, you would be willing to, to take on that role or continue that role? Yeah, I can I can continue uh, if uh, another member wants to. Okay, um, just wanna make sure that you actually want to. <laughs> um, all right, uh, is anyone else interested in serving in that capacity? Um, seeing no hands raised um, without objection and, and um, with Badri's consent, um, he will continue to serve in that role. Thank you, Badri. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. I, I, I do have to um, maybe make a clarification that this is a mayoral appointment, so the mayor will have oh. to uh, make that appointment. But I think um, there was a desire just to make sure that we weren't taking that opportunity from someone else. So. All right, then as far as we're concerned, you have our blessing <laughs> for what it, for what it's worth. All right. Uh, thank you again, Badri. You know, I know, um, you know we've all got limited time and, and it's, uh, it means a lot to, to step up and do these things. So it's appreciated. All right. Um, that's all I have for the evening. Um, if no one has anything else, I'd be looking for a motion to adjourn. Move adjournment. Thank you, Alder Fermi. Is there a second? I think Badri got there first. All those in favor of joining the meeting for this evening, please unmute yourselves and say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Tribute's unanimous. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.